I think we've become so um, loving and so protective of our kids. We don't want them to have uncomfortable moments. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is not to avoid it. It's to give them lots of practice. The very first thing is you need to get the guilt stick that you beat yourself up with and throw it in the fire or throw it in the rubbish bin. We're all doing the best we can absolutely every day of the week. And it's impossible to do perfect parenting or perfect mothering. We need our kids more than ever before to know that there's nothing they can do that will stop us loving them because they're exposed to so much more awful content they're far higher chance of struggling from anxiety, depression and self-harm than ever before. How to deal with um, the jealousy between the f- brothers? We know the more connected they feel, the less likely they experience the jealousy. So what would you advise those parents? The rough and tumble play, um, again, we need to bring some of those things back into our school grounds. Because the kids are learning from that. They're learning to negotiate. They're learning to watch out. They're learning to be a bit more mindful. What would be the biggest differences between girls and boys? Girls are cognitively ahead of boys at birth. Părinți cu minți cu Simona Gherghe și Oana Moraru. Un podcast Zunivers. Bun găsit! Sunteți la Părinți cu Minți, locul în care învățăm să fim părinți mai buni pentru copiii noștri. Sunt Simona Gherghe, alături de mine, ca de obicei, Oana Moraru, specialist în educație și parenting, autor de cărți, fondator de școală și uh, Oana, avem astăzi o invitată cu totul și cu totul specială, pentru că este o autoare de carte care nouă ne place foarte mult și care personal m-a ajutat foarte mult. Este vorba despre uh, Maggie Dent, profesor, consilier educațional, autor de cărți și de podcast și mama a patru băieți. În România este tradusă de către cei de la editura Univers și se numește Mame pentru băieții noștri cartea și mai există și Mame pentru fetele noastre. Pentru că Meghi, deși este mama a patru băieți, are acum și nepoate și prin urmare a putut să scrie și o carte pentru, pentru fete. Hello, uh, Maggie Dent. It's a pleasure to have you here at Parins Gumins. Mm-hmm. Hello, beautiful ladies. It's it's a joy to uh, chat across the uh, the skyways as we um, as we do because we're all committed to wanting to do the best we can at raising our little girls and little boys to be healthy, happy, and heard in our world. I have to thank you for the very beginning for these books because uh, uh, it helped me so much, especially this one um, uh, for uh, mothers, for our boys. Uh, it made me understand my son, who is now five years old, but also my husband. <laughs> <laughs> He's a grown-up boy, <laughs> yeah, and uh, now we have a better relationship um, yeah. uh, together. And also with my daughter, who yeah. has uh, seven years old, and I'm a yeah. mother of two uh, small kids. Wana um, is uh, Wana has uh, a daughter, but she's my daughter is 21, but I am also a teacher. I'm running a summer camp now with boys and girls age yes. six to 12. So. Yeah. Like we've yeah. been in the fight for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as Maggie is a, is a mother of four boys and I can make a joke she's alive. <laughs> I am. I know, right? Yeah. And what's really interesting is that um when my I was when my fourth son arrived, I had so many people, particularly mums come up to me just just so sorry for me and mm-hmm. one was going to light candles in the local church <laughs> and sometimes later when they meet me you know like you know I was in my late 30s and 40s and they'd say I had four sons and they go you don't look too bad <laughs> so it's like when we have social conditionings that imply that that is the less favored gender to be able to raise it get, gets buried really deeply And then when we have the layers over the top that give messages, of course, that boys are supposed to be tougher um, and so we should treat them more harshly in order for them to turn out okay, when in actual fact, it's almost the reverse. 
that every single child will thrive if they have secure attachment and they are they feel seen, heard and understood. Yeah. And so that kind of I just had so many mums coming up to me saying I have no idea. They just drive me mad. Why don't they listen? Why do they forget everything? Why that why that? And so um it's been kind of like um I was very inspired to write it. And um I was stopped recently on a holiday in Canada by a Canadian mum who reached out, grabbed my arm and said, "Maggie, don't you save my life? I've got 3 of them." <laughs> and it was your book that helped me understand and see the world through those those eyes that I was not raised with. But what would be the biggest differences between girls and boys? <laughs> well, we won't go into the physical differences because they're pretty yeah. obvious. But I think um what and I really wasn't aware of how big the difference was until my granddaughters arrived. And that was when I started to see deep thought in an 18 month old girl and i'm thinking what is she thinking about what she was doing she was trying to work out which parent to ask for a biscuit and which would be the best to meet her needs she was 18 months of age and that's when i started to go whoa i i have never seen a boy in deep thought because they are wired for movement physicality and impulsiveness and we have to mainly blame the testosterone and we know that lots of this is already on the DNA um even though we know let's make sure we put the disclaimer out there are not just a girl box and a boy box there's just kind of like a statistically significant number around 70% that are fairly atypical um and that you could have a girl that's like me who I'm more like a boy than I was a girl because I couldn't understand girls. So I played with the boys and also I didn't like dresses and I didn't want to do it. So I wasn't as though I was confused about my gender that I was born into. It was just I was trying to reject it because it was really really difficult mm. and that is just the first layer. And then in schools, as you know, Anna, um we just assume all children turn up like one size fits all and i noticed because i was a high school teacher first that does not happen in a high school classroom when you have coed i very rarely found girls forgetting what day of the week it was <laughs> what subject it was where they sat yesterday um i i didn't see them as disorganized and chaotic as i did the teen boys I also didn't see them doing ridiculously impulsive silly behavior that escalates um particularly around 14 and I also didn't I you know you could mention to a girl I really prefer you didn't do that or make that choice next time and 9 times out of 10 they wouldn't do it but you can say sometimes to a boy 3 or 4 times and they'll just keep doing it so I think they're this just this what we need to recognize is that girls are cognitively ahead of boys at birth and that cognitive advantage follows them into early transition and it follows them into high school and until we recognize that and really pay heed to that and maybe allow some of our boys a little more time to shine i think we'd see a significant shift in how um boys who disengage and boys who um you know have problematic behavior in our classrooms because that it's it's just not the natural environment that they that they thrive in until they're mature enough mm-hmm. but but why has that for a start <laughs> but yeah but why they forget all the things you say to them <laughs> oh look i really did try i dug really hard into neuroscience but <clears throat> it's there's not there's not empirical evidence but the anecdotal evidence is overwhelming and i think When I started to see my granddaughters at 2 remind me of things um mm. they not only forget um they not only very rarely forget anything they especially <laughs> this is the worst bit they don't forget when we muck up like 
any unpleasant experience, so what we know is memories are anchored into the brain more with an intense emotion. So extreme excitement or absolute horror. And that then anchors it into the brain, which leads to their predictability as we go forward. We're not sure, and we do still think it's to do with estrogen, that the memories of boys, they have to be really significant, but there's still a really good chance that they probably won't remember it. Can I give you an example just mm-hmm. yes, from my own world? So they've all grown up and at university and we've gone on a trip on a snow trip and we're in a hot tub chatting about, you know, what sort of parent I'd been. And one of them said, oh, but remember the one about the snakes, mum? And I'm looking at him going, oh, there was one time where you fell asleep on a slope and a snake coiled up next to you. He said, no, no, that other time. And I'm looking at him and he said, so he was possibly seven and his little brother was four and a half on a push bike. They're going around a lake, which is a wetland, very prone to snakes in summer. And all of a sudden, a snake, a poisonous one, a tiger snake was across the track. He rode over it quickly and then told his brother to stop and he skidded and then instead of waiting he like was faking the snake to run around it to get on his brother's bike to ride all the way around the lake to come back and get his bike and then to come home so like not 10 minutes from there he's home and I never heard the story why The single focus (laughs) tendency (laughs) of the boy brain, right? The single focus tendency is in the moment and then, oh gosh, I can smell food or I'm home or no one died. And that's one of the most frustrating things is that, and which is why when we understand this with the men in our lives, we can become so much more empathetic. When we were still in kinship communities, way back in the earliest days of man, the men had one job to do at a time. One, go and kill anything that threatens the mothers and the children. So it's a saber-toothed tiger or a mammoth. Now, if you don't need to kill one of them, your job is to go and kill a large protein. So a deer or a buffalo or something like that. And if you've got enough meat and no one, it's unsafe, you go practice killing. One thing at a time so what are the women doing everything else because that's how we survived the women had to look after all the children the elderly the sick they had to find the medicines they had to find berries and seeds they had to find a small protein they had to just so can you see how we have different minds that are wired from biology which also is why we end up with massive mental loads mothering today in a world where the digital (laughs) where the phone has got into it as well and added more load so we are naturally the organizers and guys are naturally the one thing at a time even though they are stepping up and i'm sure they're stepping up in romania as much as here they want to be heart-centered loving fathers Mm -hmm. yep yeah and sometimes they will forget things And we can get frustrated, they forget things, including picking up a child. There is no intention to forget things. They're just still, as grown men, not as effective at remembering stuff that they, let's put it out there, if it was something they were really interested in, they don't forget that. (laughs) How about um, today's mothering boys? We know mothers are very verbal. They need to explain, to over-explain. Boys, uh, when they're six, seven, eight, or even less, they tend to play in a rough way. They tend to tease each other. I supervise, you know, um, breaks in in the schoolyard, and they tend to be what it looks like aggressive. I know it's not aggressiveness. <laughs> it's just horseplay and the need to push each other. And, and the parents today just want to stop that from like the very beginning like let's not be harmful to each other let's not play this way this is dangerous is is there a line where we just let the boys be boys and take a risk with their horseplay and 
you know, yeah. dynamic uh, play. Yeah. And this is another thing around the way that girls and boys tend to play is um, boys often will play and if they like another boy, even their brother, um, they express it through their physicality. But what we see, especially as loving mums, is we look like that wrestling looks like someone can get hurt. So if I stop it, no one will get hurt. But so often, that is exactly our boys making the dopamine of enjoyment and connection. And this is exactly what they've done forever. And I think we've got to recognize that there will be times they hurt each other, but there is not an intention to hurt. And it's in that that they learn what Dr. Peter Gray says is a play code. They'll work out, oh, that was too hard. And then they'll recognize within themselves, oh, okay, that wasn't that wasn't good. But you're right. I really believe, especially around, shall we say, um, superhero play, guns and weapons mm -hmm. play, right? Because I was a mum who was never going to buy any gun for their boys. However, they make guns out of Lego and sticks yeah. and toast. And if you listen to what's going on in the play, little boys are often saying, let's get the baddies and save the goodies. Now, I'm going to say that is that archetype that I mentioned before about being the one who kills the baddies. So it's not a bad thing. However, I think in today's world, we need to recognize that sometimes that play can be frightening for other children or it can be too rough for some children. And so that we need to put a boundary if the children are going to play that game. Maybe you go over that part of the park and leave the other children here. But there's a really second thing I want to touch in there is there are some girls like me who love that play. So it shouldn't exclude the girls who are the strong, feisty girls who are going to be our, you know, our firefighters and our mountain climbers. And mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to recognize that. And also the same when they're around 13 to 14. In the classrooms, they would be oh, trying to wrestle each other or trying to strangle each other or slapping each other or sitting on each other. And so often they get punished for that behavior. However, we know in adolescence, one of the biggest drivers for both our girls and our boys is to connect with kids of their own age. And so they're actually trying to do that. They are equally as impulsive as toddlers in that window. And what is the intention behind it? And I think sometimes when we punish them and we're still punishing little boys as well for sometimes being accidentally too rough, we punish them, we shame them. And then that creates something wrong with them as a boy. And I know that can come out as deep anger and deep rage as puberty hits or even later where something that happened when they were littler that was quite innocent was made to feel definitely as though there was something wrong with you that you should have been able to stop and you can see how that can flow out and be problematic later so the rough and tumble play um again we need to bring some of those things back into our school grounds because the kids are learning from that they're learning to negotiate they're learning to watch out they're learning to be a bit more mindful because the way they learn is not a lecture. You're absolutely right. And what do we do as mainly women is we're going to give you a really long explanation why that's not okay. But we know they are not able to comprehend the same number of words in a single conversation than our girls, mm -hmm. which is why I often suggest to mums, don't forget, use some proximity hat on your head. Lunchbox, bag, bag, door. We just, because spatially, they pick up those cues really quickly. Whereas you could do a five minute, you know, uh, endless message to a girl and she's still with you in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Whereas your boy, he'll glaze over because he can't remember what you just said. Mm -hmm. And I think we, when we understand that, we can also recognize at times, hang on, I think I... Yeah, I think I need to just use fewer words right now. But also, can we connect with them before we give them those fewer words? Because so often little boys, 
because of their impulsivity and their need to move, we're forever saying, stop doing that. Don't do that. Stop touching your brother. Stop jumping over there. Don't. So when we don't on them all the time and we know on them, it creates damage to their self-worth. So our little boy's self-worth is formed by how do they judge themselves in their quiet moments? Did I hit the target? Did I win? Did I build a big tower? Mm-hmm. Or mummy's just saying how bad I am all the time, so I must be bad. So again, it's a really important thing that we're nurturing, that we can guide. We come over, rub their back and say, you look like you're jumping on the couch. I think we do jumping outside. Yep. And we just guide them because mm-hmm. that's that subtle building up of shame. But how can I let them harm each other? Anna and Vlad, uh, they are fighting all the time. And uh, I don't understand this kind of a relationship because I'm a single child. And this is consuming me a lot because I don't know how to... Yeah. Yeah. Be okay, there. so a couple of things. Yes, is that yes. there are some places it's far more um, safe to do rough and tumble. Yeah, so concrete on a second balcony, <laughs> all not a good idea, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why we have things like trampolines, why you would have, um, you know, somewhere like a carpeted area with lots of cushions. You know, like at the end of the day, even I who grew up with brothers and who was a girl who played with boys, there were times that I used to think, oh, it's too much for me. I would take a cup of tea outside so I couldn't hear it because most of the time no one gets hurt and the boys are having a fat time and even when sometimes someone gets hurt we just have to say I don't think you meant to hurt your brother I don't think you did and what can you do to make that right and so often You know, the messages in Mothering Our Boys are the number of mums who had boys who wrestle and fight all day long and then you find them sleeping together in the same bed at night and you'll, that's when you'll know they're okay. This is kind of a, a male way of them interacting rather than saying, oh, let's play a game like this and you go first and I go second and that's very much a more female way of creating their play opportunities. Now let's help the moms who have like a little lamb boy boy yeah. and he's surrounded in the courtyard in the schoolyard with a lot of rooster boys um, and this lamb boy feels rejected or mom or dad feel that they need to harden him to make him stronger yeah. belong to that group what would you advise these parents who do not take the time to recognize you know that each boy or girl has its own personality and you know the surroundings can no longer be adjusted all the time to their needs yeah they not cannot be changed in fact so i have like yeah I think- <laughs> big drama in school with these boys that are not good footballers they are not good at climbing they're not good at swearing just like the others and they feel rejected and pushed aside yeah what would i tell her mom his mom I think where we're shifting towards is that the traditional patriarchy has painted that the only way to be a man mm-hmm. is to be a big, loud, powerful, stoic man that is like a hero who's just super strong. So what that shows is that those rooster boys that we tend to have have got a bigger potential to reach up to that. But what we were looking at is that the lambs um, were perceived early as needing to be toughened up or mm-hmm. they were and, and it's one of the common things that I hear dad say yeah, to me I hear it come out yeah. my mouth when I see him being simp- you know empathetic to his sister or being kind there's a part of me that says that's not right and that's the depth of social conditioning so not only do we need to recognize they are equally valid because the lambs are not necessarily weaker they're usually capable of more empathy and more thoughtfulness and genuine kindness and often the roosters at the very end of the spectrum of of temperament lack that so what we really want is to have them both in the middle and this is why sometimes we have siblings <laughs> mm-hmm. you got a rooster and a lamb they're picking up those bits and pieces around the edges but i'm going to give some suggestions that say lambs are quite often just a little slower to shine 
So you may have, and it goes for girls as well as boys, Mm -hmm. you know, they're so driven to succeed and to shine. They all conquer physical things so much earlier. The bike without trainer wheels, the monkey bar, climbing the tree. And we think, oh, I need to push the other one along. We give them opportunities. However, pushing does actually the reverse because it shames them for not being the strong Mm -hmm. child their other sibling is or anyone else in the class. So we have quiet chats to our boys saying, oh, girls, you know, you're you're coming. You're going to have what you've got inside you isn't quite as obvious as the rooster kids. But the world needs these people as well. We need you to save others. We need you to save the planet. We need you to be the ones who turn out to care for others. So in other words, we need to celebrate that. And I had two roosters and two lambs. And my second lamb, um, I never wanted him to leave home. He was such a thoughtful young lad. He would make me cups of tea when I was stressed. Um, He was also the one who would um, share whatever he got. You know, if he got Easter eggs and the others had eaten them all, he would just share his automatically. And then as he grew older, his courage stepped forward. So we don't push them. We encourage them with when you're ready. And even though he was physically strong, what I noticed earlier was he was the one who, when he got, you know, to study, he studied harder because he he just had it in him to persist and to be resilient even more than the roosters. So at different times, we don't just look at the external, we look at what's going on in the inside of them. And that particular lamb, they're all surfers, my boys, He surfs the biggest surf from his brothers. So I'm going to say, do not be fooled that there's not a depth of courage and there is not something wonderful hiding in your your lamb son or your lamb daughter and that we're going to give them the best opportunity that says they're going to be equally valid one day. What if they are followers? They don't have like ideas on the playground and their parents are watching them and say, oh, look, my kid is not a leader. He is just following the others or she's just like, what would you advise those parents? Well, my best advice for anyone raising children is that you need to be able to create opportunities for them from as little as possible to teenage years to play in large open environments with potential risk with as many um multi-age children of all ages with all genders Mm -hmm. and all of those things will be fixed because Mm -hmm. we know that older children are biologically wired to become responsible for younger children when there is not a growing up right there so we need the growing up to be within a safe distance of a big screen yep and then secondly we also know that the younger children are watching what the older children do And this is exactly how they pick up the social skills and the emotional skills and the gaming skills and the negotiation skills. We shouldn't have to run social and emotional learning programs in our schools. We need to go back to how Mother Nature did it in the original. Even if it's neighborhood play, we've got to get back to that Mm -hmm. because we know that it's often the lamb child who's cautious to recognize a potential risk that a rooster child will not consider and they often are the one that come in and help when someone is hurt Mm -hmm. so again this is exactly how mother nature intended us to raise our children i agree how to deal with the the jealousy between the brothers Okay, so jealousy is a really normal thing, particularly, um, and it really gets stronger and more of a problem if our kids do not feel as securely attached in the moment. So that's why we keep on talking about the more that your kids know that they love them fiercely and unconditionally, even if they jump on their sister from the top bunk, we know the more connected they feel, the less likely they experience the jealousy. So I'm a huge believer in one-on-one time, even if you just have to lock a couple in the bedroom to have some one-on-one time, the more one-on-one time that we have, the less the jealousy will appear. Absolutely. So it's again, and I have to say, there's absolutely no way that we can meet all of the needs of our children all of the time. And so we've got to be able to attune in to what is it that 
I know my connection time with my son or my daughter that they absolutely love and makes them feel fabulous. And it's not always the same. And I love the five languages of love for that reason, because they're slightly different. And when you find out what is it that makes my child feel really connected to me or to their dad or to their grandparent, and then we're filling that cup, we tend to find that those things like jealousies or those things like, um, you know, the sibling fighting, we tend to find it drops. And then the other part to it is you've got to create pockets of joy, right? Pockets of joy mean just create fun because what we know is jealousy comes from a space that something's not okay in my nervous system. I'm feeling less than, I'm, I'm, I feel I've been left out. So therefore, the micro connections we put into our kids over time, not just the macro, and let's have some fun. All right, let's do, uh, are you? Let's have some fun. So I keep saying to parents, be ridiculous more often. Just lighten up. Become a dinosaur and chase them over the house or become a tickle monster or just sing really badly or dance really badly because what we know is those big feelings create cortisol, which increase the chances of our kids struggling and melting down. But if we can, at this, just before they get to that peak point, lighten the world up, create different neurochemicals, it will just fizz out. Mm -hmm. And I think we've become so stressed as parents that we're not doing a good enough job or I'm failing in some way because my child's having meltdowns or they're unhappy. When we need to see it through a lens of that's actually showing that they're growing and developing exactly as little children with little brains need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about lo losing or winning? We know boys and girls <laughs> test each other, especially boys. And I notice like a lot of parents are trying to teach them very early when they're six or seven to just take a loss in their game, like to accept that they're losers. Can boys accept that they lost this game when they're six or seven? Aren't they supposed to get angry and we accepting this anger? Or are we supposed to just deliver them a speech about how this is not important for them, it doesn't <laughs> matter, and so on and so forth? Oh, it, just like any social and emotional skill, you actually have to experience it as soon as possible in your life so that you get better at it. So in other words, I think we've become so um, loving and so protective of our kids, we don't want them to have uncomfortable moments. Mm -hmm. So we avoid it. I don't know if you do a pass the parcel like we do in Australia at birthday parties or musical chairs. It used yeah. to be one winner. And when you're under five... You know, it's it's we we absolutely validate for kids. Isn't it yucky when you don't win? Doesn't it feel yucky in your tummy? I don't feel good when I don't win. But the bottom line is not to avoid it. It's to give them lots of practice. So as much as possible and also quick games. You know, the old snap fish games that we played with cards. Anything that's a quick turnaround with your children mm -hmm. is constantly teaching them how to lose. Mm -hmm. And I hope there's a game over there that we have over here. It's a card game in a tin. It's called Spot It. And it has images on it. And what's really good is it is like really quick turns. Yeah. And I can tell you now that even growing ups lose this game. Because sometimes our eyes just don't mm -hmm. register what's going on. And when we've got a really feisty girl or a boy that goes, oh, no, how could I not see that? What we do is we help each other see what we didn't see. So, in other words, we're helping them to see the card, they could, the, the image they couldn't see. But then we go three, two, one, and we're straight into it. So, in other words, we let them react, we let them help someone else, and then we have another go. Mm -hmm. Now, an hour of that is great training. And I think the other message, especially for our boys, remember self-worth can be linked through that. But we also know girls with unhealthy perfectionism really struggle with when they're not achieving at the level they want to achieve at, which can become unhealthy. So striving for excellence is great. 
But striving for perfection can be equally as problematic for girls as not being able to lose well for boys. So the other one is that we actually model it. We might actually say, look, it's the sports carnival today and, or tomorrow or during the week. Let's have a couple of days practice. Let's pretend that you lose the running race by this much. Yep, let's go and have a practice. How does that feel? Bit yucky, doesn't it? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to put a smile on and say, I had fun. I had a go. Yep. And secondly, practice going up and shaking the hands of the person who won. Right? And if we don't put actual choices of behaviours into their mental, you know, psyche and practice it, then they're just going to keep melting down. So in other words, our job is to give them opportunities for that. And if I can give a quick example, I wasn't a very fast runner and my dad recognised that. And when I was about eight, he said to me, I can see that you, you, you don't run very fast, do you, love? And I said, no. And he said, you know, maybe next time you're in a running race and you're coming last and it feels a bit yucky, wave at the crowd. <laughs> and you know what? It was so much fun waving at the crowd. I mean, I fell over a couple of times. I was so excited. But not only that, it was like I suddenly saw I wasn't the only one who couldn't run fast. So then I'd be looking for other girls. We'd hook our arms and run last together. But he did say one other thing. He said, what I want you to keep believing is that winning isn't always eff- everything. It's great, but it's not always everything. What is everything is that we always have a go, even if we don't have a chance of winning because in terms of resilience and grit that is a really really big message i'm going to keep on trying even if i've got no chance of winning so we need to model it at home um i want them to see what it's like when i get beaten in monopoly um do you know what i mean yeah i want them to see growing ups don't like losing either but what we do when we don't lose is we go oh yuck Mm-hmm. Let's have another go. Let's talk a little <coughs> bit um, about the meltdowns um, after school or um, kindergarten because um, I was uh, so worried about uh, the way children, my children cried when uh, I picked them from kindergarten now from yeah. school and I didn't understand what was in their head. What, <laughs> what happened? Why were they yeah. so oh, was a tragedy yes. in the school? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And don't we just automatically think the worst? Yeah, sure. No. They've had a We've terrible had day. Something awful has happened. We catastrophize it, <laughs> yes. don't we? Okay. So there's a couple of things happening there and that we know that our children, when they are away from us, they have to use so much more of their energy to be able to keep themselves okay. You know, and it's not just listening to instructions and sitting still. Um, it's trying hard. And it's just looking happy, even if I'm a bit sad. And of course, for our boys, it is even harder because there's there's so many commands on them. And also, um, you know, quite often our little boys, they aren't as capable in those moments. And watching a little girl who can write her name and color beautifully within the lines can make them feel pretty yucky. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a whole lot of these things. But what we need to know is that when they come towards us, At the end of a school day, well, sometimes if you've got a boy who'll run at you and nearly knock you over because he's so excited to see you. But when we get in the safety of the car or back home, the flooding, the relief of being finally able to let these big feelings out is a sign of how much they love us. And so it's not necessarily a sign that something happened. Sometimes it is. Most of the time, they're exhausted. Our expectations for our kids at school is so much higher than it was 20 years ago. So they have to work harder. They often have less playtime. They have less fun. There's less singing. And there's all this pressure. And of course, those of you who've got little boys will know they will not poo at school so some of them are holding on to a poo mm-hmm. till they get home where it's safe for them to drop it off they are also hangry so again what am i doing in the car that i can meet that possible volcano of big feelings is i would as soon as i'm going to be there 
I'm going to give them what they need in terms if they can if they're ready for a hug. I'd be putting food straight into my son's mouth, possibly some water. I'd have some nice music in the car, whether it's funny music or it's calming music. And if you have a child who doesn't like being interrogated, we don't interrogate them. But you might have one who wants to, usually a girl, update every minute from the time you left her in the morning and she's going to do your head in on the way home. But the other one is screaming in the back. All of that is really normal. So again, it's such a relief when we realise it's what we call the body budget. This is Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett's work. You know, there's only so much energy in a child's body that runs the whole body. It's not just the energy to run around the playground. It's the energy that get, turns the oxygen into blood, that, you know, the digestive system, the, the brain to concentrate. And they're still navigating how to do that. And some days there's just nothing left. And other days there is enough left. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're looking at, what can I do that restores some of that energy? So my biggest tip is avoid going anywhere highly stimulating, like a shopping center. But if you have a chance, can you swing past a park? So there are some primary schools in Australia that have got a few days a week where rather than racing to the car and home, the, the playground is open and available for half an hour. So the children go from the class, mum grabs the bag and they just plonk themselves down and the children go off and play out in nature for 20 minutes to reset their nervous system. And some of the schools have even had a coffee van pull up. Now, is that just the best? Yeah. Yeah. How about, now let's move to a different subject, when they grow a little bit older, or about the relationship between mom and daughter. I have a 20-year-old, and I noticed, compared to other boys I'm teaching, she's so sensitive to my being critical of anything. Like, are girls more sensitive to criticism towards their mom and boys towards their dad? Is there a specific influence moms have upon girls and dads on boys? Okay, firstly, we know that the window in adolescence around 14 is like um, it creates a cracked windscreen in our teens, which means all the changes that are happening changes the way they see the world and how you see the world. So you haven't changed. Yours is a lovely clean windscreen. Mm -hmm. And that what we said before now feels like criticism. Mm -hmm. That's automatic. However, there is a special relationship with mums. And I, um, you know, one of my favourite experts in Australia, Michelle Mitchell, wrote a book about what, what girls really say about their mums. And I heard it too. There were times that she copped the blame for everything. And the way they spoke to their mums, I was horrified. I actually didn't have a, the same experience around boys um, because it usually if mum fed them, they were fine. Yeah, but girls... Because hunger was be, such a big yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so what we now know is that it, there is a natural pushback away from our parents, particularly our mum in that state for girls, which is why in traditional kinship communities, there were aunties. Mm -hmm. So the aunties step forward and being the guiding lights for our girls because they wouldn't be like that to the aunties. Mm -hmm. And I was like that for my nieces. I still hold secrets of their teenage years that I will never disclose. And there were times I had to have a conversation saying, I really think you need to be a bit nicer to your mum. So can you see that's quite normal? Mm -hmm. But then we go the other way and you're quite right. What comes up in all the surveys I do is, well, boys will often say mum's just really critical but it's more dad and dad is more severe and he often had morphs from being probably a bit more tender hearted in the teenage years. And what the men tell me is I'm hard on him because I don't want him to make the mistakes I made. Isn't that really a bit sad? Because what's happening is the harshness is really damaging the relationship and making that boy feel worse worse about himself and less likely to reach out to his dad if something awful happened. So again, it's you've kind of opened the doorway for my latest book, which has helped me help my teen, because there are ways that we can communicate with our teens as parents that allow them to feel seen and heard. 
that allow them to understand that some of the behaviour is actually because of all the changes. The changes create stress and their emotional centre, sadly, grows a lot in the teenage years. So they're angrier. Um, they, yeah, they have bigger feelings. And so often the safest person that they can deliver that to and project onto is mum, mm-hmm. even with our boys. So when from boys to men, when I asked who was the safest person uh, throughout their you know, teenage years, we know boys are on a journey to become a man, but nearly 60% said mum. So they can still fall back on mum, even though they're getting up and then heading off over that bridge to become a man, they still need a safe base. So it's so important that we work out when something awful happens or something they've done that you thought your own child would never say or do that, we've got to remember that the brain pruning and everything going on, they didn't ask for any of it to happen and that in the heat of the moment, they will say and do things that can be hurtful for us without necessarily an intention to do so. So our capacity to let the glitter settle find our own core and then come alongside them so that they can they can know that we're bigger than this mm-hmm. we too were a crabby moody less than pleasant human during our teenage years and we need to recognize that we now know more about why it happens but we need our kids more than ever before to know that there's nothing they can do that will stop us loving them because they are exposed to so much more awful content. They're far higher chance of struggling from anxiety, depression and self-harm than ever before. So they actually need us, the rails on the bridge, with as big a heart as possible. And sometimes kindness is your most powerful tool, especially when they don't deserve it. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that, you've got to keep it in mind because the last thing that can flip the tipping point on their emotional barometer before they run away from home, um, you know, self-harm and sometimes end their life can be quite small. Yep, quite small. Mm -hmm. And we've got to constantly keep thinking they're not traveling well at the moment. Their grades aren't great. They've just back chatted me. My, my reaction in the heat of the moment is I need to jump on this and I'm going to say, let the glitter settle. Turn up in the bedroom, offer a warm cuppa, some biscuits, shove the dog in, shut the door, or let's have some ice cream. Because at the end of the day, they're doing the best they can in a really difficult world during a biggest transformation that, that is imaginable. And they don't like themselves after they've done that either. But Maggie, were there some times when you actually needed to be tough on your boys? Because moms who listen to us now would think that, I don't know, there's mm-hmm. I shouldn't show any sturdy yep. leadership towards them. I just need to be understanding oh. boys will be boys. But can you give us some examples? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How you needed to oh, be yeah, tough on them. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> And that's a really biggie because... Remember, they can't take a lot of words in and they're really sensitive to when we call them up on something that may embarrass them. So our timing around those conversations is really important. And sometimes um, it would be I've noticed, you know, I've seen them, you know, they might have had friends around the house and I've just heard them using some offensive language. I don't do anything in that moment Mm -hmm. because that will then add the shame and fire them up and they'll be really angry and they won't hear you. But what I'll do is afterwards or whatever, I'll have, can I have a quiet chat? I called it a deck chat because I could have them on the deck where their brothers couldn't hear it. And I would say, and I'll always start with something that's positive. I thought you had a lot of fun today. Hey, look, I just need to let you know, I heard you use this language and that's not okay. That's not the man I want you to become. That language is not okay. Even if your mates are doing it, It's not okay in our house. Okay, got it? Bang, boom, punch on the arm straight into the house. So those little little conversations is one way that we pull them up on stuff. But secondly, they get suspended. They've been, you know, they've been vaping or something and they come home 
And of course, a part of them is really full of shame and anger at themselves and dreading what's going to happen. The same thing again is that who is the best parent to have that conversation around it? And how do we have the conversation? Because absolutely, we know the dangers of vaping, but we also know it's become kind of like really trendy among teens. Yeah. It's so easy to get. They think it's safer than smoking. You know, a whole lot of things. So when you go pick them up and you bring them home, we, we're going to sit down, we're going to feed them first, and then we're going to have a bit of a chat. If no one else is around again, do never have these big chats when anyone can hear it. And that's when we're going to say, I can, I can see, can you tell me about vaping? It wasn't around when I was around. Can you, can you tell me what's the, what is the thing? You know, what's it taste like? And what's the attraction for teens? And where do they get it from? Like, have a really honest, can you tell me what it's about? Mm -hmm. And then how about we find some really good information? And that's one of the things I'm putting in the book. If I do a chapter on that, I've got all the links to the best sites to get accurate information. And then we're going to sit there going, so I'm not sure where you're at with this. Is it, you know, are you vaping occasionally? I can see the nicotine addiction is pretty serious, but I'm going to need you because this is your problem. I'm just going to support you as we work out how we don't take them to school and how we can avoid becoming addicted to them. Because experimenting with stuff is really normal in the teenage window. And, you know, like don't remove all their technology. Don't ban them from soccer. Don't punish them. We're guiding them and teaching them in this journey. And then one of my best tips is to make them outraged. <laughs> I would say something like, do you know that tobacco companies are deliberately targeting teens and kids so they can make millions of dollars of profit and they don't care that kids get sick. They just don't care. They just want the money. Doesn't that make you a bit annoyed? And then the second one I do over the top of that is, you know, the plastic things, they're really disposable. This is your planet. Those things are going to end up in our dolphins. They're going to end up in our, in our sea life. They're going to end up contaminating our environment that is already struggling. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. And then leave it. No justification, no shaming, no big X. I'm just dropping you with some stuff. And then we let them go and think about it because they will think about it if we let them go and do it and then we might check in just casually in a day or two saying just just checking in what sorts of what's your plan going forward what are your choices going what's your plan yep yeah. so that i want them to recognize that making decisions has a consequence and that some of the consequences are good and some not so good but we all make mistakes on this big bumpy ride to adulthood <laughs> And um, in the end, Maggie, I would like to um, give an advice for um, the mothers who are watching us and maybe they are very exhausted, uh, very tired with the children in schools, kindergartens, home. How to find some time from the, for themselves? Oh, look, the very first thing is you need to get the guilt stick that you beat yourself up with and throw it in the fire or throw it in the rubbish bin. But it's because that's the biggest thing that we do, <laughs> right? No, we're all doing the best we can absolutely every day of the week. And it's impossible to do perfect parenting or perfect mothering. And I think that's a really important message. I tried it and it didn't work. And that was before I had had to have a phone that had 58 different WhatsApp groups so I could work out what mm -hmm. was going on at school and what was going on at sport and what was going on over there and how to order the library and book the doctor's appointment. Like, it has really made it harder to be the organizer of the family. Okay, so my next tip is, who, if you are lucky to be co-parenting with a good human, sit down and work out what is it that absolutely fills your cup, whether you love going for a run or a swim or it's a you know, coffee by yourself without making a decision or it's yoga or whatever it is. I want you to work with that co-parent where you are going to put those in to the week in a not negotiable place and that whoever you co-parent with does the same. Because when, when, our, when our parents have got a bit more in their tank, when they come back, we don't need a lot of time to be refreshed. You know, that makes a world of difference that we do that guilt-free. And we also do it in a way that says some days work really great, some days don't. You know what? Good enough parents around 30 to 40% of the time 
can raise awesome kids. I want to see them that I'm an imperfect parent because they're an imperfect kid and we still love them. That's welcoming and encourage them to understand that life isn't a smooth journey. I think that's such a big one. Um, and if you do need to cry, have a cry. If you do need to eat some chocolate some days that are going to make you braver, just do it. Put the guilt stick down. I follow your advice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maggie Dent. Încă o dată vă prezint cartea lui Maggie Dent, Mame pentru băieții noștri și nu uitați că există și Mame pentru fetele noastre. La editura Univers. La editura Univers. Thank you so much, Maggie. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Take care, Thanks ladies. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Bye. I enjoyed your presence so much. Good luck and good health. <laughs> Bye. 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 Da, a fost o uh, întâlnire uh, foarte, foarte interesantă. Da. Pentru că ea are și energia asta de bunică. Eu am mai ascultat oare și înțelegerea aia de după ce te lupți ca femeie mm-hmm. da, în primii ani când vrei să le faci pe toate corect. Și are așa o înțelegere de la înălțimea naturii umane. Mm-hmm. Uh, și apropo de ce povestea într-un uh, interviu, că una din figurile cele mai importante dincolo de mamă și tată, a fost o mătușă pentru ea. E una dintre puținele vorbitoare pe temele de parenting care uh, abordează acest subiect. Cât de important sunt alți membri ai familiei în viața copiilor noștri și cum mătușile, unchii uh, da, reușesc ai, să da. accepte copiii cu, fără critică, fără judecată. Uh-huh. Și apropo, mi-a plăcut mult ce a zis că sistemul ăsta nervos al copiilor muncește tot timpul să se acomodeze, să se ajusteze, să, nu știu, să îi bucure pe cei din jurul lor, adulții care îi ghidează. Și uneori, realmente, ce avem nevoie cu toți în viața noastră, nu uneori, sistematic, e o prezență în, în preajma căreia să dăm drumul la tot ce ne ține în starea asta de uh, luptă și de supraviețuire și de acordare la nevoile celorlalți. Și apare să aibă energia asta. Adică, știu că în fața ei și adolescenții care au serioase probleme reușesc să se deschidă și să spună ce au pe suflet. Cred că e important doar să urmărim pentru energia ei, nu numai pentru ce spune. Și, că, că, și cărțile copiezi. sunt foarte, da. foarte interesante, vi le recomand. Pentru că le-am citit și v-am spus, m-au ajutat să înțeleg niște lucruri. Um, ne pregătim de finalul... Uh, Acestui sezon da. și le spunem părinților cu minți care ne urmăresc că le mulțumim foarte mult pentru că au fost în număr atât de mare și în episoadele acestea alături de noi și uh, să avem cu toții o vară liniștită, fără griji, fără griji să și ne stresăm mai puțin, nu? multe momente pe cont propriu de încărcare. Mulțumim da. foarte mult, Oana. Vă mulțumim și vouă că ați fost și astăzi alături de noi. Să aveți o vacanță minunată. Pe curând! Zunivers Podcasts